he says here, may Allah have mercy on him. And concerning the intellect or the mind. It is a cause of knowledge also. And it has proofs in the Quran. What type of knowledge does the mind promote? Both types. Necessary and earned. Inferred, Yani. So which, how's that? Now we're going to see. He says, وَمَا ثَبَتَ مِنْهُ بِالْبَدِيهَ فَهُوَ ضَرُورِي Anything confirmed by the mind, by, let's say, intuition, is necessary knowledge. Intuition is basically your most basic function of your mind. It, it works automatically. That's what's meant by intuition here. Intuition is not a feeling. That's not. I don't mean that here. Okay. When someone says, ah, my intuition, he means I have a gut feeling. I'm not talking about that. Talking about something that's automatic in yourself, like knowing that one plus one is two. It's intuitive. Anything confirmed intuitively by intuition, that's daruri, necessary knowledge. كَالْعِلْمِ بِأَنَّ كُلَّ الشَّيْءِ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ جُزْئِهِ Like knowing that all of something is more than some of it. Knowing that all of something is more than some of it. You don't need a proof for that. That's automatic. Uh, so then that's ilm and that's daruri so one way the mind functions in other words is he's basically saying your mind functions in two ways one way is something intuitive it's its own basic function there you don't have to yeah and as long as allah gave you some wits it's going to click for you so that one is the daruri وَمَا ثَبَتَ بِالْإِسْتِدْلَالِ فَهُوَ اكْتِسَابِي And anything that's confirmed by proof that's earned knowledge. Or by inference, if you want. Inference, that means deduction. Then that's earned knowledge. Uh, deduction is basically math. Though I'm not good at math, though. With ideas more than numbers. It's, it's like math with ideas. So you start with a premise. And then you add another premise. You put those two together and you get a conclusion. So the premise is one idea or, no, or notion. And the other premise is also another idea or notion. You put them together and then you come with a conclusion from those two premises. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. So, talking about science, Premise is another word to say hypothesis, correct? Um, when I say premise, I mean here starting point. Okay. Something you start with. A base. So you start with something. Some idea or something. Or a claim. So you say, for example, anyone who does miracles should be believed. That's a claim. And that's a premise. If you want to use it, it's going to be a premise if you want to use it to get somewhere else. Okay. If you're just claiming it, a claim, claiming a claim, it's just a claim. Anyone who 
did a miracle should be believed. Period. Okay. Can I add something there? Yes. Muhammad did miracles. So, what's the conclusion from those two premises? That Muhammad Wasallam is a prophet. Uh, but say it according to the way I worded my premises. I'll repeat for you. Anyone who did miracles should be believed. Muhammad did miracles. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, therefore Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa um, is truthful. Correct? It, it is what correct. Is Both of your answers are correct. But what I was just trying to get you to do was derive your conclusion based on the words of the premises. Exactly. Okay. So the way I said it was, whoever did miracles should be believed. Muhammad did miracles. So if you put those two together, you say, Muhammad then should be believed. Okay. That's the conclusion from those two premises. Okay. So this is an example of istidlal, a deduction, or an inference. It has a major premise, a minor present, a, a minor premise, and a conclusion. It has what? A major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. The major premise is the broader of the two. The minor premise is the more limited of the two. And then the conclusion is what's extracted from that. The Arabic word for the premise is muqaddima. Muqaddima. And istidlal requires muqaddimatain two introductions muqaddimatun kubra a greater introduction wa muqaddimatun sughra a minor introduction meaning premise a base a starting point and a natija natija conclusion Yani, an end. Let me share something with you. So, an example of proper inference is to say, a prophet performs acts that defy nature and cannot be discredited by anyone belying him. That's a premise. Whoever does such acts must be believed. That's the second premise. Muhammad did such acts, so Muhammad must be believed. That's the conclusion. So this argument is composed of a minor premise, which is the more specific of the two premises, a major premise, which is the more inclusive of the two, and a conclusion, like a math problem. If the premises are true and added properly, then the conclusion is true. That's how it works. We're not saying here, anytime you do a deduction, then you got knowledge. No, we're saying, this is how the mind works. You can arrive at knowledge by way of a deduction, and this is what a deduction is. So how are you going to know that you got at knowledge by a deduction if a deduction doesn't is not guaranteed to deliver you to knowledge by a rule which is if your premises are true and you put them together properly then your conclusion is going to be true so if your premises are true yeah then your conclusion is going to be true and if your premises are merely what? One. If your premises merely or one of them is merely an assumption, 
then your conclusion's going to be an assumption. It might really be true, but you won't know yourself. You understand? Crystal clear. This was the way of the companions. They did use deductions. And they applied it to the Quran. For example, during the Caliphate of Uthman, a woman delivered after only six months of pregnancy. Uthman sought counsel about her case. Is this evidence that she was an adulteress who was already pregnant before marriage? How's she going to give birth after six months? She just got pregnant. I mean, she just got married. It's only been six months. Was she already pregnant? She committed Zina? Is this proof? So Earthman, he, he had a meeting about that. In that meeting of minds, Ibn Abbas recited an ayah, got corrupted here in my document. وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا Carrying him and nursing him is for 30 months. Carrying him and nursing him is for 30 months. 30 months, that's two years and six months, right? Yep. Okay. Then he recited another verse. وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْن Weaning him is in two years. Uh, so you put those together. If nursing is 24 months, that's this part. Weaning him is in two years. وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْن 24 months. And pregnancy and nursing together are 30 months. That's what the first ayah says. وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا Then the minimum of pregnancy alone is what? Six months. <laughs> they, they therefore did not consider her an adulteress. Instead, they all resorted to what Ibn Abbas said, and it became an Islamic consensus that the minimum of pregnancy is six months. Uh, I'm just not going to take the time to fix this now so that I stay on track with my lesson. So it's, and they did that by deduction. Yes. Because they put those two together and came to the conclusion. It was Ibn Abbas who did that. He showed them. Also, after the death of the Prophet wasallam, the companions briefly differed about the rulership. Said the Ansar, there should be a leader from amongst us and a leader from amongst you, immigrants. The discussion was lengthy until As-Siddiq ascended the pulpit and he delivered a speech wherein he recited to them this ayah. للفقراء المهاجرين الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم وأموالهم يبتغون فضلا من الله. يعني this was a PDF and I turned it into a word document. So when I did that, it corrupted the Arabic. يبتغون فضلا من الله. يبتغون فضلا من الله ورضوانا. وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ For the poor immigrants, those driven out of their homes and from their properties, seeking generosity from Allah and acceptance. They support the religion of Allah and they support His Messenger. They are the honest ones. So Abu Bakr said, Here, Allah calls us immigrants honest. He's setting up a premise here. And he commanded the believers to comply with those who are honest when he said, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha wa kunu ma'as-sadiqeen. 
All those who have believed, fear Allah and be with the honest. So, these are his two premises. He says, here, this ayah is about the muhajirun, the immigrants. And Allah says about those immigrants, sadikun. Those, they are the honest ones. Then in another ayah, Allah says, be with those who are honest. Be with the honest ones. So Abu Bakr saying, therefore, don't oppose me. Agree with me and comply with me. I'm going to tell you the truth right now. So that's exactly what we're talking about now. But he didn't give them the answer. They knew the answer. They understood that. He gave them the ayah, then he gave them the other ayah. So they're just going to put it together. So after establishing his premises and leaving the conclusion to their intellects, yani he didn't say therefore. They knew the therefore already. And he narrated for them that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-a'immatu min Quraysh. The Imams are from Quraysh. And then they believed his narration and they settled upon his judgment and they agreed to what he said and thus this difference vanished by the blessing of As-Siddiq. So that was a case also of Istidlal, putting premises together for conclusion. And they used to do this all the time, the Sahaba. Likewise, the beginning of the world is proven through such inference. One would say, everything that changes is an event. This world changes. Thus, this world is an event. So if you want to be good at this, then when you put your premises together and draw your conclusion, extract the words of your conclusion, draw the words of your conclusion from the words of your, premise, your premises. It's going to make it more exact instead of changing the words. Another example, following this first one, thus the world is an event, that's our conclusion. Then every event needs someone to make it occur. Make it occur. So now this next premise is based on our confirmed conclusion. Every event needs someone to make it occur. I mean, could it make itself occur? This world is an event. We just proved that. Thus, this world needs someone to make it occur. Wa subhanallahi wa bihamdi. And Nasafi says here, وَأَمَّا الْعَقُلْ Concerning the intellect فَهُوَ سَبَبٌ لِلْعِلْمِ أَيْضًا It is a reason for knowledge also وَمَا ثَبَتَ مِنْهُ بِالْبَدِيهَةِ فَهُوَ ضَرُورِي And anything confirmed intuitively is necessary knowledge كَالْعِلْمِ بِأَنَّ كُلَّ الشَّيْءِ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ جُزْئِهِ Like the knowledge that all of something is more than some of it وَمَا ثَبَتَ بِالْإِسْتِدْلَالِ فَهُوَ اكْتِسَابِي And anything confirmed by inference or deduction, then that's earned knowledge, acquired knowledge. وَالْإِلْهَامُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَسْبَابِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ بِصِحَّةِ الشَّيْءِ عِنْدَ أَهْلِ الْحَقِّ And then he says, and inspiration is not a cause of knowledge, is not, a, is not one of the causes of any authentic knowledge. Inspiration does not cause any authentic knowledge, according to the people of the truth. What's meant here by inspiration is the inspiration of a If a saint's inspiration 
is not a cause for knowledge, then for sure, what's less than that, like a normal person's gut feeling, is not a cause for knowledge. And dreams are not a cause for knowledge. That's very important for some people. Why is that? Because they see their dreams like they know something. Because they saw something in a dream. And a dream is, is not a cause for knowledge. If a wali's, if a saint's uh, inspiration from Allah is not a cause for knowledge, then a dream for sure is not. Because we're talking about here the saint, this high-ranking pious man, it might cross his mind that you did something. And maybe you really did it. Because that's something Allah gives him as a saint. He might say to you, for example, he's a saint, he'll pull you to the side and say, Sa'id, pray Fajr. He won't even blame you, but you would know about yourself. Oh my God, I didn't pray Fajr. Or something like that. Like it was said about a man that he had he used to have intercourse with his wife while she was menstruating. Then their baby came out with a color different from both of them. So he was very disappointed because he was suspicious of his wife. How does a baby come out not looking like him? So he was depressed and he went to the session of a wali. When he sat in that session, without him saying anything, that wali said, a man would have sexual intercourse with his wife while she's menstruating. Then the baby would come out with a color different from both of them. So let him not blame anyone but himself. This is not definitive knowledge here. Because a wali could be wrong. So the inspiration is not one of the causes of authentic knowledge according to the people of the truth. Uh, heck of that. Uh, one of the awliya, he said, something would occur to me, but I would not accept it without a witness from the book in the sunnah. He means... I will not rely on that merely. It's not a religious proof. I experience that and I don't take it as a religious proof. Wallahu alam, we'll stop there.